studying the Word since Friday. And I will be honest, my sermon probably changed ten times since then. My mom asked me a few minutes ago, what are you going to preach on? I said, I don't know. But I'm actually going to be coming out of 1 Samuel chapter 17. study David's life at this time he was a teenager and if you know the history of David he wasn't a very big guy he was little skinny scrawny but yet he decided that he was going to be the one to take the stand he was going to be the one to fight Goliath. In the study of Goliath, he was, him and his brothers at this time was probably the last giants around. They were from God. Goliath stood nine, over nine feet tall. And I hope he wasn't the baby of the, of the group. Some scholars even say at this time, I'm not even for sure if it was Goliath or not, but they even had a bed that was 13 feet long. Now you got this little man, or I should say a young man, that's going to take a stand up against a giant. And Saul tried to armor him, put his armor on David. And Saul, he was probably at this time one of the biggest men in Israel himself. He was a big man. In 
And this is where part of my text of this message goes. Is where Saul had tried to armor David. David says, I can't wear your armor. It will not fit me. <laughs> Today's church will try to armor you with what they want you to believe. The world itself will try to armor you with what they want you to believe. Man will try to armor you. I'll even go as far as to even say some preachers will try to armor you and say if you do this and this and this, you are okay. All right. All right. But only God's armor is the proper armor to wear. The helmet of salvation. The breastplate of righteousness. The boot of peace. And all this and the sword of salvation for the word. That's what's the helmet of salvation. Sorry, I'm getting it back. And the reason why I want to target this is because so many people believe that you can just wear the helmet of salvation and not have all the other parts of the armor. Right. That is wrong. Right. You've got to have the intertwined with the rest of the armor to protect yourself. Right. You've got to have the shield of faith. If you don't have the if you don't have the helmet of salvation, then how can you have the shield of faith? Or how can you have the shield of faith and not the helmet of salvation? They work together. Sometimes when we go through every day's life, we have to arm ourselves with God's armor. But the greatest of all is what faith that David had. The faith. The faith that I am not going to quit until I defeat this giant. A lot of times when we come into life situation, even though we have the best armor, but we lack our faith. Even though we have the word, we lack to use it. I love it how when I get into study and sometimes God will push me a little bit on stuff. Because even when it comes down to studying the Word, sometimes us ourselves even lack to use the Word. We know what the Bible says, but we fail to use it when we face circumstances. Because we are trying to solve it ourselves. We are trying to fight the giant ourselves. See, David knew who was on his side. Right. Even Israel at this time knew who they were on their side, but they refused to use him. I truly believe if Israel would have took a stand and went up against the Philistine at this time, with God backing them, they would have defeated the Philistine. But they were refusing to. They were afraid to. How many times when we face life problems that we are afraid to face? But yet, we know the truth. We know that we can overcome all of it because of who is on our side, but yet we neglect to use Him. We fail to use Him. And number one thing that I believe that us Christians fail the most at is we forget to realize that it is His battle. Not our battle. Amen. Amen. We fail to use that part. It's all spiritual warfare. But we refuse to use Him. guarantee you Goliath was like, are they mocking him? They're not sending a man, they're sending a child to fight me. 
but yet it was childlike faith. Even Jesus said that. Childlike faith. David's faith at this point was so determined he was not going to give up. He was not going to turn back. And I got to comparing David's faith with a bunch of the other faith amongst the Bible. Great story. Abraham, for an example. The faith that Abraham had in God. Even though he had so much faith into Abraham, even when Abraham told him, give your son up for a sacrifice. Sacrifice Isaac. Give Isaac unto me. You can't tell me Abraham wasn't thinking, well, why do I have to do this? You promised me. You promised me that my seed will inherit great nations and it's supposed to come from my son, from Isaac. Now you're telling me to give him up as a sacrifice. But yet, only because of Abraham's faith, he was obedient. Even to the point where Isaac was obedient. Because at the time, if you studied that, Isaac was just a young man. He could have fought his dad. He could have fought against his father. But see, that's where David came in with his faith. He had a heart after God. Just as much as what Abraham had. They served the same God. They both knew. They knew that God was the altar of all things, creator of all things. From the beginning to the end, they knew who God was. Even when David fought the bear and the lion to save his father's sheep, he still knew who God was. See, there's times in life where we come up against giants. And we try to figure out how am I going to defeat this giant? Or how am I going to be obedient with what God's telling me to do? Sometimes that's a giant within ourselves. But see, that's the problem. You have to deal with yourself. See, David knew where his faith was. But if David would have started allowing doubt to come in, he could have easily have been defeated. I'm going to jump over to verse 43. It says, And the Philistines said unto David, Am I a dog that you come to me with stabs? And the Philistines cursed David by his God. And the Philistines said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to Philistine, I want everyone to listen to this, because this gets powerful here. This is where we all need to stand. This is where we all need to know who is on our side. And then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. The name of the Lord of hosts. Now it is Jehovah against the Philistines' God. And they all assembly and shall know that the Lord saved not with the sword and a spear. For the battle is the Lord and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistines arose and came and drew near to meet David 
that David passed and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. In other words, David's faith does not retreat. He presses forward. Our faith needs to be the same. We do not, we are not in defeat. We keep pressing forward. A lot of times we want to tuck tail and let Satan have his way. But we need to stand ground. When I got into studying this more and more, I started realizing how much the world itself needs to hear. But look at the division that is amongst America today. People killing each other. Killing cops is not going to solve anything. And ignoring that we have a race problem is not going to solve anything neither. But that's what Satan wants. He wants a division. And if he can get a division, he knows he can defeat you. That's where we need to be armored up. Amen. Or for an example, when I was in the volunteer fire department, we always said suit up. Sometimes we need to suit up. We need to know who our enemy is and we need to suit up. Right. And David put his hand in the bag and took this a stone and slung it and smote the Philistines in the forehead. That the stone stumped into his forehead and he fell upon the face of the earth. Well, I wish I would have got to see that fight. I wish I could have recorded it. I'd like to rewind it and watch it over and over and over. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a slung, with his sling and with the stone, and smote the Philistine, killing him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. See, God is not limited. Only us limit God. Right. Only we limit Him to what He Amen. can do. Sometimes we can even be praying for miracles. Right. But yet, if we start limiting God, right. then how do you expect Him to heal a miracle? That's right. Amen. If we start limiting God on what He can and can't do, how do you expect to be blessed? Right. Amen. Right. When we get to the point where we limit God and say, no, this is only me. I can do this. I don't need you. Right. You two go back and go on this, okay? Discover it on your own. Yep. I'll let you fall on your face a few times. You know, when Eli first started walking, he would grab a hold of stuff, hang on to it, go from one thing to the next thing, and that's how he got around. As long as his eyes were set on what he was going to go to, he was going to go to it no matter what. Amen. Even at times, my little black lad would walk beside him, he'd put the hand on her back and follow her up and down the hallway. That's how he got around. Smart little fellow. But sometimes even us Christians stumble and fall. But God is there to pick you back up. And say, keep walking. You might have messed up. You might have made a mistake, but I still love you. You're still my child. I'm still going to carry you on through this. I know you're in a battle. I know you're in troubled times, but I'm still there and I'm right there. Sometimes even the greatest teachers know to be quiet during the test. Amen. During a trial or a storm. Sometimes we wonder, where are you at when I'm going through all this? Where are you at when I'm facing my giant? Where are you at? And he's there. Sometimes he's just sitting back and waiting on you to realize.
Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the center. In other words, he took the giant's sword. And killed him and cut off his head there to live. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. There's going to be a time where our champion will cut off the enemy's head and the enemy will flee. I cannot wait to see that, to experience that, to experience Jesus coming down on my horse. See, I was always understanding when I was little growing up that we're going to be fighting it too. We're going to be up in there. I'm ready to swing. I got, you know, I'm ready to take it on. At the time when you're 10 and 11, you can take on the whole world. But then I got to study that when I got older and got the better understanding that I realized Jesus is fighting that fight. We're not fighting it. We'll be there cheering it on. You know, sometimes even though we face life decision, and this is another part of this where I was studying, it really stuck deep into me. Because even I had made this mistake before. We face a life struggle, or we face a giant, we knock him down, but we forget to cut the head off. We allow that same problem to rise back up again. Amen. Then we fight it again, then we knock it down again, but we don't cut the head off. Next thing you know, that exact same problem rise back up. Come on. Amen. They'll keep doing it as long as you let it rise up until you said enough is enough. I know who I serve. Satan will do will play that game with you all day, all night, all week. He'll play it as long as you want to play it until you say, I had enough. That's right. I know who I serve. I know who I represent. I serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. I serve someone that said, when let there be light, there will be light. I serve someone that can defeat you, Satan. I serve someone that can solve all my problems. But a lot of times we still allow it to rise back up. Even some of the greatest addictions that we try to defeat. All the time the only way we can defeat it is we have to let God defeat it. We have to say enough is enough. Number one battle in today's society that ruins marriage is pornography. Right. Yes. And they will tell you that is the hardest to break. But yet it seems so easy. But yet it is so hard. Right. Nowadays, everywhere you look, they have it listed differently. Right. It don't have to be listed as pornography. It can be listed as war broke down function. It's the same thing. It's, it's the way the enemy tries to deceive not only that, but you see it practically. You see advertising of sex everywhere you look. Even if it's trying to sell a hamburger. Or a car. The world puts it out there as the easiest 
temptation to fall into. But Jesus can overcome that. It's already there. It's trying to teach kids and try to get you to figure out who you really are. Are you a male or are you a female? Right. And the only one that can break that bondage is God. Right. break the bondage of hate is God. You know, sometimes you can have hate build up into you so much that it will cause you to sin. Right. That hatred. Sometimes I have to keep myself in check and I can get so irritated at certain certain people. I was dealing with an issue one night at work. With a certain group of people. tell you there at work, a lot of the truck drivers will tell you I'm the easy person to get along with. But sometimes I have a problem when I have to deal with a certain individual that has a problem with my faith. And I got so fired up that I just I even asked him, how can you bow to a God that don't even exist? The exact same individual looks at me and says, how can you serve a God that you can't see? I said, well, I guess we're kind of in the same boat, then, eh? But God told me those people are his people, too. Just waiting for that certain one to reach me. And then I really started questioning my faith. Is my faith strong enough to keep me going forward? To where if I had to deal with that individual like a dude, maybe even lead that person to Christ. That would be a great accomplishment. Just to be lead that one soul that you truly don't understand who God really is. But yet they put their belief in false religion. Sometimes I wish I could just open their eyes and just say, look, just look around you. And how can you tell me that my God ain't real? Look at the things that he created all the way down to the ancient. To the ant. Even the nagging mosquitoes that were created for a purpose. But yet they say, my God ain't real. Sometimes I had to tell 
Tennessee used to strike the mayor. You know, you had Goliath standing up to the whole army of Israel. One man. Yeah, he was a big man. But he served a false god. And everyone in that army knew who the real god was, but they was afraid of him. Sometimes it's the exact same principle if we have to deal with somebody that's not even with our own belief. Are we afraid of them or are we willing to stand up? Show them what's right from wrong. Steered way off of my test. Well. You know, in nowadays society. Us Christians need to make a stand. People are saying we need a change. Sometimes the change needs to take place in their own home. Right. Not only does it need to take place in its own home, but it needs to take place in the churches. Last time I checked, we are the church. So maybe the change needs to take place within the year. If we cannot defeat the inner me, then how can I defeat a problem that I know God can take care of? You see, I have to come to my senses. I guess that's one of the reasons why the Bible says you have to work out your own salvation. I can't live your salvation for you. For the exact same example as Saul was talking about when he armored David. You can't wear my armor. I can't wear your armor. You have to wear it. I have to wear my own armor. Sounds strange, no, but it's the truth. Just like firefighting, I can't put on someone else's gear because my gear is specifically made to fit me. Right. I can't wear Aaron's gear. I might get one leg in it. I ain't gonna get both of them in it. And Aaron can't wear my gear. He'd make a tent out of it. It's the same way of wearing the armor of salvation. But yet men try to push it onto men how to live their salvation. But the only thing they have to do is pick up the Bible and live their salvation according to the Word of God. That's the only thing that matters. Religion has it all wrong. There's only one way through heaven. He is the light. He is your only way. Research it. Read it yourself. Study it yourself. Amen. See, sometimes people, the only time, some people only pick up the Bible or pick up their sword or put on their helmet of salvation or put on their breastplate of righteousness when they leave the house and go to church. Right. 
Other than that, they leave it all in the closet. Young people, it is more easier to live salvation outside of your own home. Because outside of your own home, you want people to see you living right. Inside your own home, you think you can hide it. But you can't hide it from God. Some of you got sisters and cousins. Christ-like example. Because they're watching. I know that for a fact, especially with a four-year-old that repeats everything you say. Amen. You talk about watching what you say, you learn it real quickly. Live that example of Christ-like. church. Come to a word-based church. That's another thing a lot of people, a lot of churches are getting away from the word. They want to change the word. Come to a word-based church. Amen. A church that believes in the word. Right. Not just certain things in the Bible, but all the Bible. Amen. Thank you. Keep each other in check. I challenged my youth group probably two weeks ago because of all this going on in America. I challenged them, and I used the military term, I got your six, which means I have your back. And the challenge was is where we was to keep each other in check. Youth group amongst the youth group, keep each other in check. If you see one do wrong, you correct. If one is shy to go up and pray with someone, you grab that other one and they go with you. Now, I'm pretty sure I had all their attention when I said that. But I had a lot of something to agree. But that's what it comes down to. Not only as a a church family, we should keep each other in check. Yeah. And we should have each other's back. Yeah. We should be there for each other. No one should have to struggle with their problem on their own. Even if it's a problem that you don't want to tell nobody, you don't have to tell them. Yeah. Just say, I have a problem and I want you to be in agreement with me and pray with me that I overcome it. That's all it takes. A lot of times that's where the flesh comes in and it likes to snoop in other people's business and then we want to run around and talk about it. As I come to a close, if the musicians can come. I got one verse to use for my clothes. Because I know each and every one of us has faced problems. We have faced our giants in life. Some of us are still fighting that giant. Some of us are still going through that storm. But always remember Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you want to overcome that storm, you can do it through Christ.